The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's IKME Safety Centre webinar. My name is Trish Kerrin, and I'll be taking you through this topic today, Natural Hazards Triggering Technological Disasters, otherwise known as NATEC. I'm the director of the ICME Safety Centre uh, and I'm also a professional process safety engineer. I also currently sit on the board of Australia's offshore safety regulator for oil and gas uh, exploration and production, but this webinar today is purely from the Safety Centre, not uh, NOPSEMA at all. Okay, so in this topic today, what we're going to talk about is this idea of natural hazards causing problems, obviously. But it's important, first of all, to go right back and focus on what we think process safety is all about. Especially following, there's been a lot of debate uh, over the last couple of weeks on LinkedIn after the Beirut explosion, uh, seeing a lot of people suggesting that that's not a process safety incident, that's just a storage and logistics issue. I would argue that what occurred in Beirut actually was a process safety incident because process safety needs to be about maintaining control. It's not actually about loss of containment. It's about loss of control in process safety. If containment's what you're worried about, that will happen very, very shortly after you lose control, potentially. Sometimes it might be quite some time after you lose control as well. But it's fundamentally um, more useful for us to take that step back upstream and say, okay, let's talk about control as being what we need to maintain. It allows us that potential time to intervene as well. Now, to maintain control in an organisation, you have to have effective leadership, obviously, and that leadership needs to be focused. It can't just be random on things that aren't that important. It's actually got to be focused on what's really important, what really matters. And those elements, when we talk about process safety, is knowledge and competence, engineering and design, systems and procedures, assurance, leadership, uh, culture and human factors, sorry. So leadership needs to be displayed across all of those areas. And that's that's the fundamental underpinning part about understanding process safety and about striving for managing control in our facilities to prevent those high consequence or potential consequence, low likelihood, loss of control events. And we're certainly going to be talking about instances going forward now in the rest of this webinar where control was clearly lost for a range of reasons and there was certainly potential or actual high consequences as a result. So first of all, what is NATEC? You may have heard that saying or that, uh, that word around before. The best definition that I could come up with for it actually comes from the European Commission Joint Research Centre. Technological accidents triggered by a natural hazard or disaster which results in consequences involving hazardous substances, for example, fire, explosion, toxic release. They're commonly referred to as NATEC incidents. So this is the definition we take when we want to talk about NATEC. Um, so we're looking for something that's triggered by a natural hazard or disaster. So straight away, that starts to challenge some of our risk-based thinking and some of our engineering-based thinking as well, because we need to deal with that in some way. And then there is some sort of consequence involving hazardous substances uh, and, and how that then plays out. So what sort of natural hazards could we be talking about? Well, there is a range of different things. We could be talking about earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, heavy rain, lightning, extreme temperature, hot or cold, uh, volcanoes. And there are many, many other different sorts of triggers that we could see. Um, you know, it might be flash flooding instead of just standard flooding. We might be seeing storm surges occur. We might see landslides. We might see uh, forest fires. All those sorts of things can trigger or can be the NATEC trigger. And the consequences that we're talking about. It's a fire or an explosion, a toxic release, a radioactive release as well. One of the issues is that they have the potential to damage what we consider our lifeline systems, our power grids, our communication lines as well. So this then becomes a really significant issue for us. We're no longer just dealing with the natural disaster. We're dealing with the incident caused by the natural disaster, plus we're doing that with a lack of other resources that we would normally have. So we, you know, we think about, you know, we'd still have the power grid for certain things. Well, we may not in a NATEC incident, and that becomes a challenge. 
So let's look at a couple of examples of NATEC incidents. So if we cast our minds back to Pembroke Refinery in 1994, so this incident was actually the result of a, a, a severe electrical storm that caused plant outages. And due to some other issues that occurred within the facility at the time, they eventually had a rupture of a pipeline. And that then led to 20 tonnes of hydrocarbon being released, which found an ignition source, uh, an explosion and a fire ensued. Now, fortunately, no one was killed in this incident, but there were 26 people injured in it. Um, and it was you know, originally going right back to we have an electrical disaster that's triggered it. There were obviously other underlying hazards that then became apparent at that point. But the, the actual trigger at that point in time was the electrical storm. Probably the one that people uh, can still very much remember. So there was an earthquake off the coast of Japan in March 2011. And that was near the Fukushima prefecture and there was a nuclear power plant there. There was a resultant tsunami that occurred and that took out the backup power at the nuclear power plant and uh, prevented cooling systems from continuing to operate on the reactors as they were uh, cycling down. We later then saw hydrogen explosions. Um, there was nuclear contaminated water, radiological water, uh, as well as um, airborne radiological particles uh, deposited as well in that particular incident. So many of us will probably quite clearly remember that particular um, incident that occurred there. One a little bit more recently, uh, and actually, in fact, it, it's timely this week. Um, Hurricane Harvey hit landfall in Texas on the 25th of August 2017 and in fact the tropical depression that then led to Hurricane Harvey started yesterday on the 17th of August uh, 2017 and then it progressed. It subsequently um, remained pretty much in place over the, the Houston uh, slightly northern area for quite some time, a few days. And it resulted in um, equipment flooding and then eventual failure of the systems at this particular plant that we're looking at here. Uh, that then resulted in rapid decomposition of the product they were storing. They were storing organic peroxides. They then decomposed and burned. Now, that did result in uh, residents needing to be evacuated. It was really quite interesting in that, that we actually have also now seen the some company uh, managers have been indicted over this offence. Uh, I think the, the charge is actually around aggravated assault because of the, uh, the fallout um, from the fires that occurred, um, resulting in respiratory distress in people. Uh, the most recent update I could find is that it actually, the court case started in February this year, but I haven't been able to find out whether there's actually been a result from it. But that actually led the, the Chemical Safety Board to do an investigation into this incident, and they decided that they had effectively found that there was no real planning for severe weather um, amongst the, the US industry as such. So they recommended that the Center for Chemical Process Safety uh, develop some guidance in that. And so they then did develop um, some guidance document that I'll refer to you to at the end of this, um, this presentation around how to, how to prepare. Um, so again, this is a reason why I often talk about loss of control being quite important, because if you look at Hurricane Harvey and the impact it had on this particular facility here, they didn't ever actually lose containment of their solid organic peroxides. They lost control of their refrigeration system, which then resulted in the organic peroxides decomposing. So it's a classic chemical processing issue where if you don't maintain control, you can have an incident occur. You don't need to actually lose containment for that incident to occur. If I think back to where I live in Australia, um, late last year, we saw enormous um, forest fires exist all over uh, the, the southeastern part of Australia. This particular photo here actually shows a, a little bit of a fire tornado, which is quite a frightening phenomena. Um, but basically, um, all sorts of different facilities were impacted by this. It wasn't only people's houses and the the natural um, bushland. So water treatment facilities that had chemicals on site, uh, wood chip um, and timber mills that had that got fires into their wood chips that then smouldered for days and days and days, um, right deep down in the the pile of wood chips. So a range of different triggers that occurred from that one. And most recently, 
uh, only a month or two ago in Midland in Michigan, we saw a significant flood that led to two dams actually breaking and giving way that then flooded uh, into a series of different chemical facilities. Now, no one was injured and they actually managed to maintain the safety of the facilities, though there was some environmental impacts as a result of it. So you can see that there's a, a number of different sorts of incidents that could occur. I believe yesterday was also the anniversary of a, an incident in the Turkish refinery that was a result of, um, uh, I think it was a lightning strike off the top of my head, I'm not quite sure. So a number of different incidents um, can quite easily occur. And some of you may remember, if you do think about that Japan earthquake back in 2011 as well, um, there were other incidents that occurred from that particular earthquake. So there were uh, fires and explosions at oil refineries when pipes ruptured. I remember, I actually remember I was traveling at the time, I was sitting in a hotel room and I turned on the TV and saw a fire at a refinery that I know some of my friends had worked at previously in Japan. And that was really quite a, a shock to me. This was before we actually realised there was a nuclear power plant that we were all worried about. We were first seeing fires at refineries um, as a result of that earthquake. Now, the challenge we have here is that we actually can't prevent some of these things. We can't prevent earthquakes. We can't prevent tsunamis as such. We, we end up being left with mitigation. That ends up being our main strategy that we that we have to work work with. And so... We can try and, and eliminate by not building things in certain areas, but there are some things that we actually just have to have in certain areas for a range of, of good reasons. And that really challenges some of our risk assessment activities as well. So if we talk about risk assessments, the CSB, as I said, found that there was no real planning or no adequate planning for severe weather events. And in fact, the current risk assessment methodologies that we still use don't really take into account um, the the NATEC scenario. So we actually need better guidance on how to deal with this. We can use our existing systems, but we need to make sure that we can identify where the NATEC issues may be. And one of the challenges is, is that we often find ourselves in the situation of, well, that's just not credible. We can't, we can't assess that. It's just not going to be a credible outcome. And, and unfortunately with NATEC, we need to be thinking about not how credible the consequence is, but actually how bad could the consequence be and how would we mitigate it at that point in time? How do we deal with what's coming? Because as I said, unfortunately, when it does come to NATEC, we are largely dealing only with how we mitigate um, the consequences at that point. I'm actually going to give you a, a little poll at the moment. I'm interested to know um, at your facilities where you have emergency response plans, do they actually consider natural disasters or NATEC related incidents? So I'll give you a, a little moment to, uh, to complete that, um, that poll question. Okay, still see some more votes coming in now. All right, so I might actually close that poll at that point and share those responses with you. So you're seeing here that 53% said, yes, you do. So that's that's a great start, actually. I, to be honest, it's a little bit higher than I thought it was going to be, so that's a good thing. Um, 19 said no, and 28% were unsure. So, you know, we're actually really probably looking at half and half if we look at yes or effectively. If you're not sure, then chances are it, it, it may not be. Um, if you've never never seen that particular um, aspect of it, so um, so that's an interesting interesting result. There, we'll go back to the um, the presentation then. Um, so, what I want to talk about is emergency planning, which is why I asked that poll question. So often they don't consider the effect of the natural disaster on things like the utilities and communications. Uh, electricity, roads. So you've probably got um, radio systems that you're using for communication in your facilities. But if you've had a major natural disaster occur within your city, are your repeater stations actually functioning for your radios to work? 
Are the mobile phone towers still standing if that's going to be what your backup is? Or the landline phone lines? How are you dealing with communication in this particular instance? Because it may well be that some of that infrastructure is damaged and that has created a problem. So that can be a, a significant issue. Electricity, we often don't rely on electricity as much in emergency response plans because we typically assume that if there's a fire, we've probably lost electricity uh, capability or we don't necessarily want to have a um, mains coming into it at that point. But it could be affecting other aspects of the response as well. And access roads, how can you actually even get to the site? How can you get people out of the site if the roads are impassable for, for a number of reasons? If I cast my mind back to the bushfires that we saw in Australia, um, so a significant natural disaster that was occurring, we actually had a situation where thousands of people, mainly tourists, had to be evacuated from a small coastal town by Navy ships because there was no way to get out. The roads were completely destroyed and damaged in the fires. So this entire population was isolated and had to actually escape via other means. So even when you think about the population around your facility, how feasible is it for them to evacuate or indeed shelter in place? If you think about the Crosby uh, incident from Hurricane Harvey in Texas. So if you wanted people to shelter in place, but their houses were flooding, what were they going to do? Um, they couldn't really shelter in place in that instance. So how feasible are some of your plans, depending on what sort of emergency you could be facing? And of course, we're, we're seeing this in other ways at the moment, but do you actually have resources available for your emergency response? If you have a situation where for example, if we look at the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant, they were basically unable to change out the operators that were at that plant at the time because they couldn't just keep bringing people in and out of it. So the people that were there were there and the people that were outside were outside and that was pretty much what actually had to happen. So how are you dealing with the emergency resources that you may need to continue doing what you need to do in this instance? The other challenge that we see also um, from NATEC is the domino effect though. So once we have one unit have a problem, uh, the Pembroke refinery was an example of this. So the uh, the FCC unit, the fluidized catalytic cracker, um, lost containment, a pipe lost containment, they had a, an ignition source, that actually took out a number of other units. And we typically focus on, well, what happens if we have a fire in unit X, but that unit happens to be beside a series of other units or interconnected even. How are we dealing with the domino effect? Um, and in my experience, domino effects are something generally that I don't think we have a great handle on managing in, um, in our emergency response plans uh, and sometimes in our, our designs if we haven't um, used inherently safer design principles for it as well. But suffice to say that the domino effect is quite a frequent occurrence in NATEC events. It's never just one thing that goes wrong. We all know that an incident is never just one thing that goes wrong anyway. But in, in a NATEC instance, it's more common for it to be many multiples of things that go wrong at that point in time. So when we do think about our emergency response plans, you have to review them and test them like you would do for other things anyway. But you should be taking into account how you're dealing with emergency uh, response due to NATEC-related instances. A, a country where I've actually seen this done very, very well, in fact, is New Zealand. And every time I go to New Zealand, I go and visit a company in New Zealand and we go through the initial induction at whatever facility, whether I'm at a facility or a building, usually the first thing on the list is earthquake. Then we eventually get to fire. Um, but certainly their emergency response plans are very clearly defined on what to do in the case of an earthquake. And you need to make sure that you understand what the response is because they do have earthquakes on a reasonably frequent basis. Very small typically, but they can also have quite large ones as well. You need to make an assessment of the validity of the assumptions on the natural hazard frequency and severity. You know, if you're assuming that it's you know, you're not going to have a, an earthquake because you haven't had one for a while, then that's probably not a very good basis of assumption. You actually need to understand some of the, the frequencies that are going on in that particular area. What are some of the, also some of the, um, the precursors that we can sometimes see 
in some of these natural, certainly the geological natural hazards, we can sometimes see that there are precursors around small uh, earth tremors leading to a bigger earthquake, those sorts of things. Usually there's a little bit of warning before a tsunami hits, depending on the the earthquake itself, uh, that, that will change how, how much warning time there is in that instance. Um, but we now see tsunami warnings coming out far more frequently from earthquakes. Um, so there's all sorts of other things that you need to be focusing in on the, the frequency and severity of what's going on. And understand that as we continue to march forward into what we're seeing with climate change, we will see more extreme weather events. So we're not necessarily talking more earthquakes, but we are possibly talking more forest fires, more hurricanes, more cyclones, uh, those sorts of things. We are seeing more prevalent extreme weather events occur. Uh, and that is having an impact on the safety of our facilities. And we need to also be aware that the natural hazard loading might exceed our maximum design specifications for something. So if you do have a offshore facility, what sort of um, wave height is it rated to, is it designed to? And could that actually be exceeded in a hurricane or a tsunami situation even? Um, now, some of these things we just may not be able to design out, which is counterintuitive because we want to start with the idea of elimination first off, but we might not be able to do that. So how do we then cope with response? Mitigation becomes the really key thing to focus on here. So there's also some common vulnerabilities that we often see. And one of those, for example, is um, atmospheric storage tanks. So I mentioned that there were refinery fires um, following the earthquake in Japan. Following Hurricane Harvey, there were also a number of refinery fires um, where we saw floating roof tanks where their roofs sank and then the tanks caught fire or we saw um, damage to tanks that resulted in uh, leaks and then fires, those sorts of things. So interestingly, they seem to be one of the most significant areas as a, a common vulnerability that we see, although there's also probably a lot of storage tanks around. So there's a lot of them to be impacted as well. So if we think about quantitative risk assessment for a sec, there is that actually, that's one way that we can try to use it to evaluate the risk. Although you might need to look at a little bit of an adaption of what you would normally do. So, you know, we need to, for example, look at the severity of the uh, the situation. So in this instance, I've shown an earthquake. So what could be the damage states and associated scenarios? What You need to understand what the critical equipment is to be able to answer that question. Then we want to talk about um, understanding the probability of damage to critical equipment and what consequence we might see from that. Then we can look at what could be credible event combinations. And here's where we start to get a little bit different. We need to start to talk in combinations here. Um, and then the probability of each um, combination occurring to then finally get to the, the overall analysis. So we can adapt the current systems we've got, but we need to actively try to adapt them as well. It's also interesting to note, though, that if you have good mitigation processes, they can pay off. What we do see is that facilities fare far better in a natural hazard instance if they've got some specific design and implementation risk reduction methods. So that may well be things like in a hurricane, if you have the ability for um, additional anchoring of equipment, uh, if you have uh, potential flood risk, that you have critical equipment on higher plinths so that the, it's uh, above what's a credible flood height. You know, we did see in Fukushima that they did have a wall on the uh, the coastline to try and mitigate tsunami. Unfortunately, the tsunami height was far greater than the wall they had in that instance. So we do need to understand how significant um, some of these risk mitigation methods need to be. You know, if uh, again, if you if it's a high risk of wind environment, then you may have um, protective shutters that you can apply at very quick um, quick notice to sensitive or uh, significant parts of the facility to try and prevent damage by either flying debris 
or just wind pressure uh, and wind force um, causing issues as well. But we certainly do see that risk mitigation does pay off for organisations. The challenge in implementing things, though, is that we often don't necessarily want to go down that path because it is a more expensive way of implementing some controls because there will undoubtedly be some engineering requirements in that risk mitigation. But it could be the difference between your facility starting up again and your facility never starting up again or potentially something as catastrophic as what we saw as a nuclear fallout from Fukushima. Um, so you do need to weigh up the investment um, and focus on the, the mitigation aspect of it. Now, there's a range of references um, that are quite useful for you to take a look at, so I've put them on here. Now, all of these slides, um, this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto our, the ICME Safety Centre website and our YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to go back and see this particular um, references slide at that point as well. But first of all, um, there's a book that I've referred to on several different slides throughout this particular um, presentation by um, Elizabeth Kraussman, um, Anna Marie Cruz and Ernesto Salzano, um, NATEC Risk Assessment and Management. So that book was only written in 2017, so it's still very, very current uh, on that. And um, Elizabeth Kraussman, who you've also see here, I've got two papers noted as well, um, works in the European Commission um, Joint Research Centre as well and has done a lot of work in NATEC. So very, very credible um, source of information in that. The US Chemical Safety Board have also got a short video on um, preparing for extreme weather as well as their report on that particular incident that I showed you, um, the photo of from Crosby in Texas uh, when Hurricane Harvey struck. As a result of the investigation the CSB did, they issued a an action to the um, Centre for Chemical Process Safety to develop some guidance on assessment and planning for natural hazards. And so that has led to the release of the CCPS monograph assessment of and planning for natural hazards. And if you just um, Google that, that will also come up. And FM Global um, do have a number of data sheets on natural disaster activities. Um, you will find your own insurers have a lot of information available to you in this space and your own insurers will be a great source of really high quality information for you here because they see the impact of natural disasters all over the world. They have access to databases that most of us could only dream of. They actually can help you deal with this risk mitigation issue. So please engage with your insurers on this and their risk engineers. They have an enormous amount of information to help you in this particular area as well. So that was the uh, all of the, the prepared slides I have. I'm now happy to take any questions and I see I have a couple of questions coming up now. So you can just type your questions into the questions um, panel and I will go through them and answer them for you as best as I can. Uh, and as I said, this webinar then will be shared out on our YouTube channel. So the first question I have here is, with changing climatic conditions, including increased seismic activity, instances of cyclones and hurricanes, what is considered a reasonable approach in terms of a project design, bearing in mind that the cost of mitigation measures may be prohibitive? That's an interesting question. Um, there's still, I think, a lot of work going in developing some of the standards that are needed in this space. And certainly if you're in a seismic area, there are actually standards on seismic design. I think one of the things that you might see is possibly some of the controls to put in place for um, preventative actions might be far more extreme than possibly some of the mitigation controls. It really is going to be a matter of understanding risk tolerability, as is always the case. But one of the big issues that you do have to deal with is what are you actually trying to prevent occurring? Um, you know, what is the catastrophic outcome that you are trying to prevent? And you then do need to also think about the potential impact that you could see if you don't prevent it. By that, I mean we saw a nuclear power plant get struck by a tsunami that resulted in a radiological release. Not only has it meant that that nuclear power plant will never operate again, it's also led to widespread changes in nuclear generation and even more of a step away from nuclear power plants, For as an example. 
So some of the reputational damage and reputational issues need to be taken into account in the cost-benefit analysis when you're looking at the cost of mitigation. You really need to delve into what the overall issue is in that instance. Um, I'm not aware of, of specific um, guidance for you on that though, but again, I would suggest you engage with your insurer um, or take a look at some of the work, um, some of those references that I did mention. Next question is, natural disaster includes forest fire. If yes, then what is the mitigation? So there's a number of different mitigations that you could have in this particular instance. Chances are you're not going to stop the forest fire ever existing. Um, but things like fire breaks, so this is a substantial tract of land that has no uh, nothing on it that can actually combust. Um, so the fire can't reach over that. Um, now, some of those fire breaks would need to be quite substantial with some of the magnitude of fires that we're now currently seeing. But there are also things like um, passive fire protection. So if you've got equipment, then consider putting fast passive fire protection on that equipment so that if the fire comes through, your mitigation is that your equipment is intact because it has been protected by a coating of some sort. Um, another potential um, thing is fire retardant uh, can also be used. So, for example, we saw instances in Australia this year where significant fires were occurring and a, um, a heritage protected old um, ski lodge was under danger and it was being firebombed by fire retardant and they did manage to save it. Um, you know, there might even be um, thermal wrappings that can be used in instances as well. I, I saw some of, some of those being used in the recent fire season as well. So there's a number of different things that you can do to try and protect the sensitive areas that you need to protect from forest fires. Um, you know, try not to build a chemical plant right in the middle of a forest is a good start. But then actually make sure you've got the fire brigade breaks, make sure you've got the situations where you have the proper fire, um, fire retardancy, fire protection, passive fire protection systems installed so that the fire won't actually impact and you can then restart again. Um, I don't have any other questions coming through at this stage. Oh, got one now. Okay. Uh, Hang on, let me just open this one up. It's quite a quite a long question. Okay. Uh, most of the safety studies are being moved to a risk-based approach and NATEC uh, leading to loss and containment scenarios being a double jeopardy event will always be on the bottom of most probability. So these will be considered only for emergency management plans and be missed in the design. Other examples where NATEC leading to a loss of containment was considered as a credible scenario for design decision. That's a really good question. I'm not aware of any specifically, but I have, I, I'm generally not in a position to see um, detailed design risk assessments and, and the like. I would refer you through to the book by um, uh, Elizabeth Kraussman on that um, and the, the research that they've done in terms of understanding risk assessment. But you're right. For years, we've talked about the fact that we're not going to assess double jeopardy because it's double jeopardy. But the fact is, when it comes to this particular instance of NATEC, we need to consider it. And again, it's not so much considering the probability of it, because oh, so not so much considering how we get the consequence, because how we get to the consequence actually is not quite um, that much of an issue for us. Mitigating the consequences is what we have to worry about. So we will always be looking at the emergency plans and mitigation for a trigger that we cannot um, cannot design out. We can't design out earthquake as a trigger because we can't control earthquakes. We can't control hurricanes. We can't control lightning. There's a number of things, but we can mitigate what happens with it. And that's where we need to be focusing. So whilst traditional risk assessment has always put it sort of at the bottom so we don't really consider it, we actually need to at least focus on making sure we consider it in the mitigation side of things. I hope that helps answer your question. Uh, new nuclear power stations in UK consider double jeopardy for NATEC in their designs. Well, that's actually quite um, that's quite good to promising to hear. So thank you for that um, that feedback. I think that's a really important um, important thing because we are in that situation where you do need to be concerned about that and and the UK itself has has obviously seen a number of um, 
in particular flood events and storm surge events over the last couple of years. Um, so, you know, we're still seeing, it doesn't really matter where you are in the world, we are seeing um, these instances occur of extreme weather events or um, natural disasters that are leading us to these issues. Okay. Any other questions? I'll go back onto that references page for you just briefly as we we wrap up. If no other questions, okay. Um, so no other um, no other questions coming in at this point in time. Um, Okay, thank you very much for your attention today. I hope uh, I hope it was valuable for you. It was just a little bit of a snapshot into it. There are certainly a lot of people that are very well versed and have done a lot of research into this. Um, so please do go and take a look at some of these um, these references. I am clearly not an expert in this, but I can make some observations over what we're seeing. So we do need to um, make sure that we continue to focus on what we're actually doing, understand what we need to be mitigating and build those mitigations in. So I hope it was of some use to you as a very basic introduction. Um, so I've got one last one. Um, and thanks to those who highlighted that the UK, UK nuclear industry are considering double jeopardy. Any references will be appreciated. So if there is anything um, that potentially can be shared in that space, that would be fantastic. I'm happy for it to, um, if you don't want to share it out directly, the Safety Centre could take that information in and share it out more broadly through our social media channels if that's easier for you, if, if you're able to assist us. Um, there won't actually be a certificate of attendance provided for this, um, for this session. Uh, we don't actually provide certificates for that. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for your questions and your attention. I wish you all a very good day wherever you are in the world. And uh, please stay safe, particularly as we see, for example, at the moment, the US is starting to head into peak hurricane season at the moment. So hopefully we can, um, we can get through without any issues over there. Thank you very much. Goodbye.